are rolling. Okay. Okay. This is uh, July 4th, 2010, and we're talking to Mike Nicholson about his uh, career in climbing and caving. Uh, Mike, you uh, started climbing with your family, correct? That's correct, yeah. My father and mother and brother. And you were about, say, 17 at I the think time? I was 17 when we first started climbing. Yeah. And this would be roughly 1953? Yes. Okay, and you were um, started out in, in West Virginia, right? Well, I actually started climbing. Oh, right. We started climbing here with the Washington Group, with the PATC, where we met every Sunday at the uh, hot shops at uh, Western and uh, uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, right. Uh, so you first be got into... Sorry, just, just one last sure. little thing here. And uh, I can hear the uh, rustling of your papers a little bit. Oh, okay. So be a little... Keep it to a minimum. Okay. Yep. Let me know when you're ready. Yeah, when okay. You're ready. Okay. Okay. Originally, you started with cave exploration. Yes, we started. Uh, the, we, as a family, we started camping in Maine and things like that in the summer, and, and then that extended to some. We liked it a lot, so we started camping out in Western Maryland, and we got involved in a. Started looking into an old coal mine out there, and a ranger came by and said that you shouldn't go in there because it's dangerous. And if you're interested in caves and things, he g gave us a reference to the caving group in Baltimore. And we lived near Baltimore at that time. Mm -hmm. So we made contact with them and found a book on Caves of Maryland and started caving that way, just on our own. And, um, and Huntley Ingalls joined us back in the very first caves we went in. So we did a whole series of small caves in Western Maryland and, and, um, and West Virginia. And then worked our way down, finally going down to um, Germany Valley and going in some caves there. And when we discovered, uh, we went into to a schoolhouse, which of course in those days was open, and uh, looked over the edge of the drop there and decided we needed to learn something about rope work. So we joined up with the rock climbers then and um, to learn something about rope work. And well, we, the, it, all of us really took a shine to rock climbing. That was as much fun or even more than caving at the time. And, so we, we climbed pretty intensively, I guess practically every weekend. And um, my parents were simply amazing in their, their love of travel and, and willingness to drive a anywhere at any time, and, which took in those days you know, many, many hours to get to Seneca from Baltimore. How long did were, it take? There were no interstate roads or anything. It had to, I don't know, but it took a long time. And my, we've got go down Friday nights and come back Sunday nights. And uh, so anyhow, we climbed back in the early days at Carter Rock and the local areas in Bull Run and Great Falls, Virginia. And the folks back then were, my brother and I were certainly the youngest climbers <coughs> when we first started. And, um, you know, everybody, Arnold Wexler and Jane Schoerker and uh, Don Hubbard and the old gang were, were all you know, seasoned professionals in their careers. And, and mm -hmm. of course, climbing then was nothing but a part-time um, endeavor. And it's what you did on Sundays. So, so we climbed uh, for several years um, with that group. I'm not sure how long, maybe four, four or five years. And who, who took you down to Seneca first? Um, I can't quite remember. But it was in those early years. Sure. It, it wasn't long after we started climbing that we went down to Seneca. Right. You went into schoolhouse with Paul Bratt. Yeah. And our first trip, uh, you know, into schoolhouse, with Paul Bratt took uh, Huntley Ingalls and myself. And, and we did the inner wells and the angels roost. And I still remember that trip with vivid memories. It was just absolutely, you know, sensational to us. And um, I loved the cave ever since. Right. right. Do you still do it? And uh, well, schoolhouse is not open. My right. schoolhouse is not open. Right. Yeah. yeah and I, I did a lot of caving after that. Mm -hmm. We. Um, I really enjoyed my association with, with the I, I with the professional people, uh, scientists at NIH and. Uh, 
uh, people that worked at uh, the Bureau of Standards and things like that. And I think that sort of, I was always interested in technology. Mm -hmm. And when I started college, I majored in microbiology and that's been my life. And um, I think those people had a lot of influence on that. And because um, they, they were real serious about a whole lot. And then what they did was very interesting to me, even though I was still a teenager. Right. And, um, and they took the time to talk to you about yes, it. Yes, yes. And especially, you know, at places like the Hot Shops and things like that. It was mm -hmm. a great time for discussion and sitting around at the bottoms of climbs and things. And, mm -hmm. and um, so then in, um, we continued doing both climbing and caving all through the 50s. And um, uh, people that joined us were uh, Jim Shipley in the, in the later part of the 50s, I think. And, um, and by then, the Adams family were climbing. Mm -hmm. And um, and, uh, and, and mostly still did doing local climbs and things. Right. And then things changed for me a lot in, the, in the 1958 when my father discovered a cave, which we called Butler Cave Sinking Creek System in Bath County, Virginia. And that turned out he was very good at discovering new caves. As a matter of fact, he found 60-some caves. How did he, how did he know where, where to look? He would just hike around the hills and find them by himself, or he'd drive along the roads and see a farmer, mm -hmm. you know, tending sheep or, or, or doing some uh, hay cutting or cutting something hay. like that. Mm -hmm. He'd just go over and lean up against the fence until the guy got curious, and he'd come over, and they'd share a snip of whiskey, and He'd talk him into hiking up the hillside all the way up the mountain to show him all the little holes and places where the cold air blows out and things like that. And he was just a master at, ah. of patience and, and good relationships with the local people. Mm -hmm. What did your dad do for a living? He was a cartographer. He worked, um, he worked for the government and in a private company and uh, did some very interesting things. In the Second World War, he, he, he and some fe uh, friends had a mapping company here in Washington, and they made detailed maps for the Flying Tigers in Burma. And um, that sort of, you know, really interesting stuff. And I still remember in going in the dark room and developing negatives and things to, to make these maps with. It was fascinating stuff. So cave mapping came easy. To so end. cave mapping was uh, came easy, and uh, and so that was my father's passion was maps. Wherever we went, for anywhere in his life, he would know in detail. Just everything about the you know whether it's Mexico or Canada or or out west or whatever. He just had a memory for places and names and. The history and geography and geology of all of that stuff. So he had all that in his head before he got there. Yes, yes. Right. And he was amazing because he, he just remembered it all immediately. Wow. Tell us about the um, the Butler Cave Conservation Society. Well, um, first I'll go into a quick history of Butler Cave. So we we discovered Butler Cave in 1958 and started going on trips, trip after trip after trip in there. And it developed, it, the, the entrance is up on the side of a mountain and it goes down pretty quickly into the syncline. And um, it just developed immediately into this big cave system. And then after maybe on about the eighth or 10th trip, we broke through into a big, a big trunk, trunk channel, which is a huge passage at the bottom of the syncline that goes down the strike and has streams in it. And when we broke into that, I mean, we'd been going in in pretty good sized caves. Some of the passages were 60 feet high and, you know, 10 feet wide, 20 feet wide and things. But when we broke into the trunk channel, it's literally huge. You walk into Sand Canyon and there's nothing but blackness to the right and blackness to the left. It was amazing. And this was all Virgin Cave. No one had ever been in Butler Cave. So we worked on that and... Um, when we got down there on July the 6th, 1958, we made our breakthrough and got about two miles down the passageway, encountering several different stream systems and everything. We were so excited we couldn't believe it. 
And uh, to give you an idea of what that trip was like, we went, it was a 4th of July weekend. We drove down from Baltimore, which probably took six or seven hours. By that time, my parents had purchased a little cabin on the Bullpasture River in, in Highland County. So we had a base of operations. <clears throat> and um, we went in the cave probably at dawn on Saturday and made the breakthrough sometime you know, several, maybe six or seven hours later into the trunk channel, which we called Sand Canyon at that point. And um, um, my brother had, a, we were doing a climb there and, and I fell out of the climb and came crashing down about 20 feet and a, a rock that I'd pulled loose hit my brother in the eye and cut his eyebrow pretty badly. So he was bleeding. So we, we went out, which took another several hours, six, seven hours, and, um, and many climbs and things, lots of up and down work. And took him, we, we came out, took him up to the doctor and he stitched his eye up and he was feeling a little bit dizzy. And we came back, he stayed back at the cabin because he wasn't feeling real well. So then we came, we went immediately back to the cave, ate some, ate some dinner at that time, went back into the cave, we're caving. Uh, and it wasn't long, <clears throat> we didn't get far past that place, the accident place, when we discovered um, the biggest part of the cave. And, um, and we, we just said, my gosh, Dave, my brother, will just really feel badly if we go and explore this without him. So we went back and got him by then it was the next day and uh, went directly back into the cave again and cave for another 15 or 20 hours solid. So in the end, I think, and we got down to the July 6th room on July the 6th. So we, we've been caving without interruption for probably three days. No sleep, no rest, no anything. And um, by that time we were bushed. And then we had to drive back to Baltimore so that was a, a momentous trip, and that sort of set the stage. Um, shortly after that, we went in and uh, camped for a week. I think there were six or seven of us, my, my dad, my brother, and myself, and um, um, Huntley Ingalls, Oscar Estes, Dave Pittman, and Pete McMurray, I think those were the people. So we set up a base camp and, and went out exploring and mapping every day for I think essentially a whole week. I remember when I first came out, and we didn't go out at all during that time. Mm -hmm. When I first came out, Huntley and I crawled out of the entrance together and the entire world looked blue, just unbelievably right. blue. And it was the most, one of the most visually striking things I've ever seen. I'll never forget it. And then within 15 minutes, our eyes had accommodated and, and the grass looked green again. Mm -hmm. That was an amazing experience. Were you using carbide lamps? Yep, the, whole carbide, time? the cave is all red. There are no blues in there. So I right. guess our brains tried to accommodate that. And when we came out, there was a big color shift, sort of like going mm -hmm. from daylight to tungsten on film. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and then we explored in there off and on for years and years. Um, and still, I was still doing climbing also. Mm -hmm. And um, I teamed up with a guy named Joe Faint, and he helped me do some cave work, and we did a lot of climbing together. And um, I was climbing with Jim Shipley at that time also. Mm -hmm. He lived near you? Yeah, he lived, he was a neighbor actually in, in Linthicum in, near Baltimore where I lived. Mm -hmm. And um, I finally made connection with a, a lot of cavers from Penn State, and they, um, they came down to help us start mapping. Actually, there was a person there, um, I can't remember his name right now. He was doing his master's thesis on Breathing Cave, which is a, a separate cave, but it's actually mm -hmm. part of the whole system geologically mm -hmm. and hydrologically. And um, so he was working on that and they, they had mapped Breathing Cave as a, as a big project for that whole grotto. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were really, they had developed the, I think, the, the best mapping methods at that time. 
So they came in enthusiastically to help us map it in the, I guess, early 60s. <clears throat> and so that just, I kept caving, but you know, not as passionately as I did then and, and was climbing off and on during that time, mostly locally, but some yeah. out west, the Schwangunks and some out west in the Tetons. And, um, so I think the, uh, one of the more interesting things that happened that they, we had locked the cave up from the early days, but people mm -hmm. had broken into it occasionally and messed up some of the really fragile formations and things. Mm -hmm. By that time we had, I guess on our, the first summer we'd probably done close to 10 miles of passage in there. And, um, and maybe three, three or four linear miles in extent, three mi linear miles in, in extent from one end to the other. So we, the Penn State people, somebody got some good ideas and we decided to, form, to buy the property from Carl Butler, the owner, and, um, and form a cave conservation society. So we would have a more structured way of protecting the cave because it was just more than we could handle by ourselves. So in there we had a lot of manpower and a lot of science. And so we made a really good entrance that was just bomb proof mm -hmm. and a very sophisticated gate and formed the Butler Cave Conservation Society. I believe it was 1970. Okay. And it's still operating. And um, I actually, no, I think it was 1968. I take okay. that back. Um, and that's still operating and the group is still active. It's still run as a, it's actually a tax exempt corporation. And we have about uh, maybe 40 members now. Has there been a generational change in the membership or is it still mostly? It's still mostly, um, mostly older people, science oriented, mm -hmm. a lot of geologists, mm -hmm. but a lot of hardcore cavers. Mm -hmm. But most of them tend to be pretty technical people. And um, Why do you think that is? I don't know. I think it's because the, most of them came from Penn State. And, and most of the cavers were geology students. And, and that sort of set the tone. So even the people that aren't, you know, science-oriented professionals tended to be, you know, pretty, um, I don't know what to say, settled down with careers and everything, mm -hmm. even if they were fairly young. It's not a, it's not a wild group, you know, of so really hardcore cavers, but they tend to be very um, organized. Mm -hmm. So the BCCS has continued to map and explore in there. And the, um, the entire valley, which we call Burnsville Cove, um, now has several other large caves and they are indeed part of the whole system, but we're, they're trying to connect up some of these caves. We have a total of, I don't know, there may be 10 caves of significance in the, in the valley. Breathing Cave is one of them, which was known in the Civil War. That's the only mm -hmm. old known one. All the others were discovered by the group. And they've been working, some of them are extremely difficult. Butler is actually a rather easy cave. Mm -hmm. um, one they call Bobcat is extremely difficult. And altogether, these things now compromise about 64 miles of map passage. And we're trying to connect them all up, which will make it one of the major caves in the world. Mm -hmm. And they certainly are connected geologically and hydrologically. We've been tracing streams and tracing air currents and doing you know, detailed mapping and um, uh, mapping sur surface survey mapping and tying all that in with topo maps and things. And of course, computers have allowed that to go on. Yeah. Interestingly, one of the first maps we made, one of the guys I was working with that I haven't mentioned was Dick Cutts. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was at NASA back in the, this was probably in the um, early 60s. And we actually were able to get our, he was actually able to write a program for one of NASA's computers. Of course, we didn't, I'd never heard of a computer. Right. And we actually did, plotting of the map on, on, on the NASA computer of the survey points. <clears throat> wow. So that was uh, kind of, a first. Uh, pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So the BCCS has become sort of a model for cave conservation. And um, 
there are several publications out on mm -hmm. the on the on the on the cave system and everything. What was the financial commitment for that? Um, back in the old day, I think they decided originally um, that dues were like $100 a hundred dollars a year or something, and a lifetime membership was a thousand. Some of the people were students and they couldn't afford very much, so right. you know we made it, it. Everybody discussed it and decided what was what was good. Some of the people were, you know, could use the, the tax exempt status, um, either for local caving or for overseas caving. In mm -hmm. fact, mm -hmm. and um, Nevin Davis is one of the founding members of that group and was president of the society for decades. And uh, but the group is still going strong and. Um, in fact, they're down there this weekend working on some major leads and I'm <laughs> waiting for emails. How much did the, the whole property cost? Do you remember? The property, let's see. I believe it was something like $30,000. It was about 100 acres. So it was a lot of money back then. It was a lot of money. We just decided at a meeting and made a commitment and everybody said, we'll do it. I think Nevin Davis had... had accumulated enough money so that he could um, put some money in and then we got a loan mm -hmm. and um, were able to do it by a loan and paid it off and then you know 10 years later or something we burned the mortgage oh wow since then we bought another piece of property on the on the in, uh, in, in the, the cove Burnsville Cove mm -hmm. and did the same thing there Matter of fact, we've even done a different one down in far in southwestern Virginia. We bought the property and eventually sold it to another cave conservation group. Okay. And um, so putting your money where your mouth is yeah. has been good for caving. Yes, and we've been able to protect the cave. We've been able to direct the traffic in the cave to either to useful things instead of just tourist trips. Mm -hmm. For the most part, it would be mapping expeditions or uh, geology work. There've been several. Uh, master's thesis mm -hmm. written on magnetic reversals and things like that in the cave from Penn State. One of our founding members was uh, Dr. W uh, Willie White, who was chairman of the Department of Geochemistry, I think, at Penn State. Mm -hmm. He retired just a few years ago, and he's still active. So he's had a whole bunch of grad students running around in there taking samples of all sorts of different projects. And um, some of that has been documented in a NSS bulletin, mm -hmm. and um, and we're about to put out another bulletin, some twenty or thirty years later, to bring everybody up to date on the the exploration and the science that's going on there. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a. Does it surprise you that climbing has been less tied to scientific endeavors? Well, I don't know whether it surprises me. It was. Um, because originally, when I first started climbing, it seemed like most of the people I knew were worked for the NIH or the Bureau of Standards or mm -hmm. some such institution. And um, so my, my first impression of the first years of rock climbing is that these are, you know, highly, highly uh, high achievers, science people that are interested in doing outdoor stuff. And that, indeed, that's what they were. And so it kind of set the tone then. I haven't had a whole lot to do with climbing, you know, since the 1960s. But I'm, I'm aware that, you know, it's become quite youth oriented and competitive and um, full time, lots of full time climbers. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, one of my climbing buddies, Joe Faint, that I did climbs with at, at Seneca and, um, and Champ Rocks. Um, he became, uh, we worked together at, mm -hmm. at a company while I was going to college, and that's mm -hmm. how I met him. And he started climbing with me, and then he, after a few years, he went on, he quit and became a big wall climber out in, in Yosemite. Mm -hmm. And um, when I met him 10 years later out there, he couldn't believe that I was still working. <laughs> you know, he said, nobody works anymore, you just climb all the time. And he'd just been making his living and doing odd jobs and things like that, living in, he actually lived in a little cave up in Yosemite, way up in the mountains. Huh. It was unbelievable, and nobody knew he was there. 
was you know, rangers couldn't find him. Yeah, right. and it just and back in those days, you know, things weren't so organized with respect to the park service and everything. Right. right. And um, so that that's the last I ever saw him. I have no idea what happened to him. Wow. Now you did a, a climb at Champ Rock with him, right? Yes. Uh, Joe and I got interested in Champ, and um, there, as I recall, there are there are two major flakes on right. the on the Champ Rocks, and the edge of the flake faces north. And we did the the eastern flake on the north edge, mm -hmm. and uh, which is about 430 feet high, and as I I think it's slightly overhung so that you can actually drop a rock and it goes all the way down to the bottom yes. before it hits the scree. And it was um, a, 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 not a difficult climb technically, but psychologically because the rock is so loose, you feel like you're about to come off with the entire end of the flight and with the whole thing. Do we spend a lot of time up there doing different climbs? And um, Of course, Jim Shipley teamed up with Joe Faint and they did some very severe climbs on the west side of the east flake yes and um that's where psychotic reaction yeah, is. yeah yeah and that sort of thing i was mm -hmm. i was there to witness some of those climbs and actually had to rescue joe fain off of one of them because he's they were they were in layback in in arm stress position for so many hours that joe's arms cramped up and he couldn't get them down wow how'd he you was, get him down we i they were near one of those holes one of those windows mm -hmm. And I went down into the window and was able to get a, a rope down to him. He wasn't too far below me, mm -hmm. and some I don't remember exactly, but he got back up into the escape window. Right. This is back in the day of a 120-foot rope? Yeah. Right. And um, so that was interesting. Were they purlon by then? or? Uh, oh, or, yeah. We right. were using nylon by then. Right. And, right. Um, what kind of a climber was Jimmy Shipley? He was a superb climber. And a superb caver, he mm -hmm. was uh, he was um, relatively short in stature and very powerful, mm -hmm. and had a fantastic sense of balance. And uh, one climb I remember he put up at Seneca was the Triple S ships ships shimmering shimmy, yep, which was a lot of fun. Right. And um, I I did it later with him, but I wasn't on the original with Seneca. Mm -hmm. And um, he he became a really good friend also, and and. Did, uh, he didn't do much work in Butler Cave, but he he joined us on some trips into Cass Cave in West Virginia, right? Which has a big, uh, 180 foot drop in that huge room, right? We took some, we took a tree down there, I don't know, a 30 or 40 foot tree. Oh, I've heard the story. Yeah. And leaned it up against the wall with a ladder attached to it and climbed mm -hmm. up the wall. Mm -hmm. And I even I have some pictures of Jim up in there, hmm. and uh, that that was quite a trip. So he did a couple trips in Cass. And I'm sure he was in Butler. I don't recall exactly when. But. Do you remember how he broke his leg at Seneca? I didn't even know he did. Uh, or I've forgotten. Right. I guess I've forgotten. Right. right. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, he was climbing with Sally Greenwood at the time. So oh. we'll try and find out. Yeah. But yeah, I climbed with him and he, he surprised me how, how graceful he was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You, you look at him and think, oh, I don't know. And then it was, it was very surprising. Yeah, and I always remember from my early days, you know, two of the people that I, that were extremely graceful were Jane Sharker and right. Arnold Wexler. The way they, and of course we were climbing in tennis shoes, right. and, um, but they taught me the value of using your feet and doing these beautiful little steps like a ballet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that stuck with me forever. <laughs> it's surprising how, how graceful Arc, um, uh, Wexler was on the rock, and yet a lot of other times he could be a, a complete klutz. Yeah, yeah. I, I was struck by that uh, yeah. watching him. And yeah. Somebody told me, well, yet, yeah, yeah, one woman said, you're lucky you don't have to dance with him. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were in on the, um, the first ascent of Coxcomb Overhang Direct, right? Yes, when I met my wife, uh, Trudy, mm -hmm. um, which was in 1967. Um, I had been climbing with a different group of climbers in those days, um, Bob Lyons and Matt Hale and um, Tom Evans mm -hmm. and some people like that, a few, and we were going to Seneca quite often. So 
Um, Trudy joined us on a trip down there and we were all trying the coxcomb overhang one after another mm -hmm. and peeling off and um, finally late in the day I got up there after falling a couple of times and uh, and so that was uh, one of the few you know really nice routes that I did there. I did a couple on the right. on the east flake uh, I mean on the east side mm -hmm. with Joe Faint. Uh, I think we called it one was called Alcoa Presents. Oh it certainly was. And T6. I had I was working in a in a physics lab over in Virginia mm -hmm. at that time. When mm -hmm. when I when I discovered Butler Cave, I was working. I was going to school full time and working um, part time at the at the um, Agricultural Research Center in Beltsville. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanted to go on the week long camping trip in the cave. And I asked my boss if I could get off. And he said no which I was so shocked I couldn't believe because of course this was very important to me like a life like once in a lifetime mm -hmm. and so I, I the first and only time I ever quit a job I told him well I'm leaving and you know <laughs> <laughs> and that was a risky thing back then yeah right? yeah people it, didn't do that yeah so I, I quit my job so I was out of college for a couple of years and I was caving full-time and well I, I got a job not soon after that mm -hmm. that had better hours and things but Mm -hmm. So I, but I did take a couple of years off before I finished school. Okay. And um, one mm -hmm. of the one of the jobs I had was over in Virginia, and I was in a physics lab, and they had a little milling machine. Mm -hmm. So I started making some aluminum pitons. You made the infamous aluminum yep. piton on Alcoa Presents. I did. Which is still there. With my only hand, with my hands, and I, wow. mil I milled. That was my first machining experience. And. Um, so I did those in the physics lab there, and, and Joe Faint and I used them. Yeah. And then we discovered that, you know, even driving them in lightly, you could never get them out again. Right. Because they just molded to the rock. Right. And, of course, we didn't know how, how big of a fall they could take. So that was a little bit of an unknown. But for, I don't know, maybe for a year we, we used them. Wow. I probably made 50 of them. I don't know where... They are, but I know there's still people tell me they're still there at Seneca. Well, yeah, I know the one is still there on Alcoa. Yeah. You yeah. can't you can't clip into it anymore. Yeah, uh, because it's so far in. Amazing, you know. Yeah. But uh, um, aluminum, hey, it, it's it's not going to rust anyway. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, how, did you fall on on uh, doing Alcoa or? Uh... Uh, no, okay. I don't think we we did. Okay. Um, and what year was that? Oh my gosh. I'm just going to say it was sometime around 1960, but I'm not right. sure. Right. So by then, did you have climbing shoes? Hmm. Probably. Okay. I would. I would think that we did by then. Yeah, clutter shoes from Europe, or uh, yeah. Okay. But I'm not sure. Okay, because that's that's a stout route, especially up where that piton is. Yeah. It's overhanging. I remember it being very thin, and and uh, and it w we might have even used the piton to hold on to or something. I, I don't remember. Right. But it worked well because it wasn't. You didn't have to drive it very hard. It just tapped in and right and held there. Right. And um, you know, I I don't remember if we used those on Champ or not. And I don't know anyone that's been up the end of the flake. Don't know anyone who's been there. And. Uh, uh, wouldn't it be ironic if no one's ever been back there on that beautiful piece of rock? I mean, on the on the end. <laughs> I I know John Markwell always said that uh, he did a one one of those uh, fins, the Arete, as a first ascent, and said it was the best climb he'd ever done. Wow. Um, he didn't say how scary it was. Yeah. But, uh, uh, it is certainly a very airy place. Yes. Yes. You get a, a, a significant exposure feeling there. Right. And you're completely alone. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's yeah. That's right. It's a long way out. Yeah. Wow. So I, I, we, we went into Champ many times. Was not a difficult uh, access back then, or uh... well, the main thing is you had to. It's funny. Back in those days, you know, we didn't, we didn't ask landowners. We didn't. You mm -hmm. just went places and did things. Mm -hmm. We walked. To, I remember we walked past this farmhouse, and he had a bunch of hunting dogs, maybe three on each side of a little road. Mm -hmm. They went towards the river, mm -hmm. and the dogs were on chains. And when they came to their 
the, the end of their chain, they were about two feet on either side of you. Ooh. And they were looked like hounds of the Baskervilles. Right. Right. And snarling and right. snapping and pulling right. on their chains. And it was a quite a gauntlet. <laughs> they would walk through there and go over and wade across the river. Right. And go up into the, spend, uh, sometimes we spend two days up in there. Oh, nice. And camping. And in the summer, it was nice and cool between the two flakes. It, it is very cool back in there. And, yeah. uh, and just a very unusual place. One of the very strange places. Yeah, lots of ferns, which you don't see a lot of yeah. uh, in that part of, in that valley yeah. anyway. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, very cool and uh, very quiet. Yeah. Because um, the, the rock walls seem to break you, you know, it's a special. A, it's a special place, and it's it it, it's all on its own, and you just you forget about the rest of the world. That's it's almost true. like being in a cave. Yeah, where you forget about everything yeah. else. Yeah, because there's very little sky above you. Yeah. when you're inside that uh, that little cove yeah. there. Wow, wow. And T six. That's the other route. That's uh, an aluminum alloy, right? Yes. 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 Hence the name. That's the the temper designation. The right. sixty sixty one is often tempered at. Right. T6, T6. To, uh, for, for right. Um, engineering, right. for, for mechanical considerations. Right, right. Um, you knew Matt Hale, had, had he just recently arrived uh, to D.C.? I know he was at Harvard. As I have no idea of what, yeah. since 1967, I haven't, haven't had any contact with him. Oh, well, he's still climbing. He's still around. Wow. Uh, and, but he's now retired from uh, EPA. Oh. Yeah, he was one of the first employees at, um, at EPA. Interesting. Yeah, yeah and, uh, I know Bob Lyons is still around here. Bob is still around. Bob had a very uh, unfortunate accident that pretty much ended his climbing. Yeah, but he's still around. He's he's also pretty much retired from the wine business. Yeah, I I heard that he sold the wine thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, now you were you mentioned that you started climbing in in tennis shoes. Yes. And you said you'd buy them as as tight as you could. Just, uh, Let my wife answer okay. that. She'll, she'll answer. Sure. It'll either ring four times or she'll answer it. All right. Skip. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Can I go get a drink of water? Yeah. Okay. Um, early on, you you started climbing in in tennis shoes, right? <clears throat> that correct. All right. And you'd buy a pair just for climbing. Yes, we we would go and buy you know. I remember going into the shoe store and trying on some tennis shoes, and um, and then when they fit, I'd buy them two or three sizes too small. And I remember the shoe salesman arguing with my mother, "You can't let him wear these; they'll ruin his feet." <laughs> <laughs> but they work great, and uh, wow. and everybody climbed in tennis shoes then mm -hmm. in the in the fifties. But and, they were so uncomfortable, you had to take them off. Oh yeah, right. oh yes, they were painful. Right. Right. Uh, and, uh, you didn't walk into the climb with those. No. Right. And, right. Um, but, you know, that we did all of the climbing. And, uh, yeah, well, I guess that's how we learned. Uh, there was an emphasis on balance climbing here. Right. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons, because you couldn't do any real edging ah. and things like that. So everybody developed these ballet moves and using your toes very effectively. In fact, I did a lot of barefoot climbing. Wow. Because I could use my big toes and things, and um, not in crack so much, but on a smooth face, and just make contact much better than a shoe even. Wow. It works great. Wow. I t climbers today would have a very hard time believing that. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Um, you know, but th that's Worked what we you. did. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember what kinds of shoes showed up from Europe uh, first? Or? You know, I don't. I think it's best I remember John Christian was the first person to come back with a pair of clutter shoe from from Europe mm -hmm. and um, I may you know it may have been as late as 1967 uh, Trudy and I went to France mm -hmm. um, and um, had designs on doing some climbing but that didn't work out very well so we just sort of toured around mm -hmm. did some mountain it's a alpine meadow hiking and things like that right and um, and I bought a pair of uh, climbing shoes in um, soft climbing shoes in France mm -hmm. and brought them back. PAs. Yeah, I think they were PAs. Right. Right. And um, they had that funny smell, like like old boat caulking. I remember. Right. 
whatever was in that compound. But they, I don't know, but it, yeah, it had a strange. But they were they were good, very good, and right. allowed us to go on. Um, do you remember how you got equipment? I don't remember. You know, probably my dad bought most of the ropes and things mm -hmm. in the 50s. Mm -hmm. During the 60s, I just don't remember. Obviously, I bought ropes myself and everything, but sure. I, I don't, sure. and pitons and things, I don't remember where right. we got them. Right. Um, I know at that time there was a Leon Greenman up in New York who used to import stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, and maybe Hollybar was selling stuff. Roy like Hollybar was selling stuff out of his basement in Boulder. Yeah, and would do mail orders. Yeah, and Steve Camito, who is a reseller uh, for the last fifty years, uh, Steve huh. Camito worked for him when he was a college student in Boulder. Huh. So and yes, I guess Roy, I, when did Chenard start selling things? Yeah, that's that's late sixties. Also, out of his um, uh, uh -huh. um, forge in Ventura. I met Chenard once in the climbing camp at, in the Tetons. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of stuff was he doing back then? Yeah, I, I don't know because I, I didn't know much about big wall climbing and things, mm -hmm. but um, this was probably in uh, 62 or 63 I was out there mm -hmm. and did some some. Uh, Fun minor climbs with Bill Glosser, who was a caver from, and climber mm -hmm. from Penn State. Mm -hmm. And Chenard was there in the climbing camp. and um, At Jenny Lake. Yeah, and he, he had a big reputation already. Right. As being a really hard, hardcore mountaineer. Right. And, um, and well, then... So. That was one of the one place he took a long fall. Yeah. Uh, and, and then he later did, I guess, the snaz. Yeah. And then it was in the early 60s, I also met Tony Solar and Ray Moore. Oh, interesting. And um, I didn't do any rock climbing with them, but I did some caving, and mm -hmm. I did some sailing, mm -hmm. and I did some dynamiting. <laughs> in caves. And Yeah, in, yeah. in caves and outside of caves. Oh. They, they were, I don't know whether you know, they were, um, they didn't travel anywhere without cases of dynamite. I, I had heard they used dynamite like firecracker. We would take a whole stick of dynamite and, and light a fuse and throw it, let it burn down until it was almost ready to go off, and then throw it. It was really fun. <laughs> they don't do that. <laughs> you can't do that anymore. Can't do that anymore. That's that's kind and of. And so of course they were they were sort of um, really wild men and very interesting. Because I was pretty. I was like their their kid that was tagging along with oh, them. Yeah. You know. But right. I was up for anything they wanted to do, so sure we were. They taught sure. us how to use explosives, and Ray wow. Moore was building a big sailboat, right? In those days, and uh, I, we often went over to to do help him and do some work on it. We were sailing uh, with another a friend of his called Joe Wegstein, mm -hmm. and he had a sailboat. And I sailed a lot with Joe, hmm. you know, on the bay, and uh, uh, so Ray designed and built his boat and. Often we would sail together mm -hmm. for the weekend, go out together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tony's often uh, underrated as a climber, uh, and it's odd because he has such classic roots. Yeah. Uh, the solar route on Devil's Tower. Yes. In addition to solar at Seneca. Yes. Yeah, he was quite an all-round athlete too. He could do amazing things. Huh. And um, I, I never did the solar route either on Seneca or on Devil's Tower. always mm -hmm. wanted to, never got around to it. I remember Ray telling me of his big fall on, on Devil's Tower where he zipped out a whole bunch of pitons one after another. I don't think I've heard this story. And he, I believe he took about a 100-foot fall wow. on that climb mm -hmm. and um, was just pulling piton after piton, and finally one held. I guess each one slowed him up a little bit. Sure. And... Um, but they, those two guys were truly uh, interesting and, and uh, crazy characters. Ray was an engineer and ran a, a company called, I think, National Electronics Labs. Mm -hmm. They built electronics for the Air Force. I don't know what Tony did, but I, I spent a lot of time sailing with them. They, they, they ran with an interesting crowd. Um, Who else? Um, let's see. Um, Lewis Martin was a diving editor for National, National Geographic. Geographic. He was in the group. Mm -hmm. Joe Wegstein was good friends of theirs. Mm -hmm. 
Joe Wegstein was one of the early computer language developers and did significant work on, in early computer language design. And he and my dad became great buddies. They, we spent a lot of time. Joe didn't go caving, but he would come along with us and um, into West Virginia and all kinds of remote areas and go mm -hmm. on camping trips and things. And we would go caving and he would sort of right. just... Mm -hmm. Martin used to own the uh, the um, uh, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright house. Yes, I was in that house. Were yeah. you? Were yes. You? Uh, shortly after it was built, I think. Matter of fact, it may have still been under construction. Uh huh. And um, I remember uh, that was the only time I went there with Joe Wegstein. Right. And um, we took a grand tour. And I believe they were still working on it at that yeah. time. Even the furniture had to be built in. Right? Yeah. I don't remember much about it except it had right. spectacular views and things. Just, right. I right. always wondered what what happened to that. I guess it's still there. It's still there and it's been restored. Uh -huh. um, some uh, IT millionaire uh, bought it uh, and it's now mostly restored to yeah. uh, uh, yeah. its condition. Interesting. And it, it's through those guys I met, um, I started work at uh, NIH, after I finally finished college in the early 60s, I, um, they introduced me to the laboratory over at NIH, so I, I got a mm -hmm. job over there and worked with uh, Dr. Carlton Geideschek, who eventually became a Nobel Prize winner, mm -hmm. and had a very exciting time there. When did you retire from there? Uh, I actually left, I started my own business in 1970, oh, so I left the uh, NIH in 69. And, but one of the interesting things that happened there with respect to climbing, um, Dr. Geideschek brought a, a young, a young uh, man, teenager, back from New Guinea, because he traveled all over the world, mm -hmm. and he discovered major diseases in New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And they were, at that time, they were doing first contact work there. There were people that had never seen anybody from the outside world and they were truly a stone age culture mm -hmm. so a, a, i don't know 14 year old boy named bogantel spelled m-b-a-g-i-n-t-a-o came and he lived up in the highlands and had seen very few outside people in the world and decided he wanted to come with with carlton and um, when I was working in the lab there, and I guess this is 1964, and Bogantel came one weekend and uh, to live here. But he missed the he missed the forest because he was a creature of the forest, of course. So I started taking him every weekend out to West Virginia and, and to mm -hmm. Virginia, where my fa my parents had a cabin on the Bullpasture River mm -hmm. in Highland County. So I would take. Bogantel would come with me and we'd go out and spend our time outdoors hiking and swimming and eventually caving. Mm -hmm. And uh, also at Carter Rock, I have a marvelous picture of him, which I'll show you later, sure. uh, of climbing at Carter Rock. And uh, so he became a lifelong friend also. Um, did he go back to New Guinea? Uh... He eventually went back to New Guinea, yes. Mm -hmm. He became a director of the Pacific Antiquities Museum or something in Port mm -hmm. Moresby. In Port Moresby, okay. Have you been in touch with him or, or later? No, I think he's passed away. Okay. And um, I guess the last time we saw him was probably 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. We took him and some other New Guinea kids uh, hiking on the Appalachian Trail. Wow. When, one winter day, I remember, my wife and I. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Wow. So there were others that came? came yeah, he too? brought other t kids back also, mm -hmm. quite a few. Oh. And um, so they were always very interesting oh, sure. to New Guinea culture. Unfortunately, I left NIH before I had a chance to get to New Guinea. But, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, there were several, several scientists that, in our lab that traveled there mm -hmm. and, you know, doing epidemiology and child development work and blood group genetics, a very um, polymath group of people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. doing interesting work. Wow. 
Did you take your own family on caving and climbing trips? You know, Trudy and... and uh, yeah, we, we, have, we adopted two children in the early 70s. And um, um, we often went to our, to our cabin and we, went, we did some caving and things. The kids never really got into caving or climbing in a big way at all. Hmm. But, you know, we spent a lot of time outdoors with them, sure. hiking and swimming and right. just having fun right. Right. and uh, traveling around. But they don't, they don't, well, actually, our one son still goes camping mm -hmm. and, and, um, and hiking with us. And, um, and he and his son uh, mm -hmm. do some caving, mm -hmm. but not in a big way, just, you know, once in a while. Well, they can't do as, as big as you guys true. did, you know. It's, it's, uh, you can't do that twice. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, did you just decide to stop climbing, or did it just fade out for you? Or? Well, what happened is uh, Trudy and I were climbing a good bit together. We got married in 1968, and shortly after that, I started my own business. Mm -hmm. And we bought this house in 1968. And um, I guess that, well, I, I, continued, cl I continued climbing locally and going out to Carter Rock. And, right. and I was into running and things like that also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, that was unusual back then. Yes, it? it was. It was. And uh, I think I started running in the, about 1970. Mm -hmm. Not competitive, just, you know, right. tra mostly trail running. The Billy Goat Trail right. became okay. my favorite place to go running. Okay. Since I okay. lived here, I could actually either run from here over to the Billy Goat Trail, which is only four miles away, mm -hmm. and um, five miles away, mm -hmm. or, uh, or drive out there and everything. And um, I had a, an employee, Glenn Randall. Oh, gosh, I know Glenn. Glenn. Yes. Glenn Randall, when he got out of high school, he came to work for me. I had a machine shop here in this house. Wow. And Glenn came to work for me one summer. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so we started climbing together. Wow. And spent many, many happy days. Or, or we'd go out for a three-hour lunch break and right. you know, go out to Carter Rock or Great Falls. Right. And, um, and, and climb pretty intensively there. Wow. And then uh, come back here and finish up work. And well, when the boss lets you play hooky, that's as good as it gets. When the boss goes with you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about Glenn. Uh, he was a phenomenal guy. Um, he lived in Rockville, and he mm -hmm. was from California. Mm -hmm. And he had previously been a surfer. Right. And, of course, he was very thin and, and lightweight. Yes. I think he weighed 125 pounds. At, at most. At most. So he was uh, quite a challenge to try to keep up with on climbing, of course, which mm -hmm. I couldn't. But he also, we ran together a lot, too. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I think it was with Glenn we started running the Billy Goat Trail. Wow. And um, then I had another, um, well, let's see, Glenn, he was incredibly intelligent. Yes. And he, he learned, you know, about machining in, in one-tenth the time it would take a normal intelligent mm -hmm. person. He was about to go to Duke University, but he was so passionate about the outdoors and rock climbing and things. I talked him into um, going to to try to um, apply at uh, in at Colorado. Yep. Which he took me up on and did, mm -hmm. and was accepted, and off he went to Colorado and mm -hmm. became uh, quite a climber, rock climber, and mountaineer from there. Yes. Yes. And I still stay in touch with him. Oh, do you? Quite frequently. Yeah. He. Um, let's see. When he got. I don't know whether it was after he finished college or you know, I think it was after he finished. He uh, he had seen um, Barry Bishop's photos of um, Ca Castle Rock mm -hmm. in Utah. Yes. And um, Barry Bishop photographed Huntley Ingalls and Leighton Corr and somebody else doing that first ascent right. from an airplane. So Glenn, I, and I was, I'm a pilot also, so... Oh. Um, Glenn came back and and said, you know, why don't you take me up flying and we'll we'll go up and I want to learn something about photographing from the air. And also, I was I was a photographing amateur photographer then, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he had decided at that time he wanted to make his career in journalism and aided with photography and mm -hmm. maybe incorporating 
unusual views as from an airplane, which mm -hmm. in those days wasn't all that common, I guess. Right. So we did a little, he joined me for some flights and, mm -hmm. and did a little bit of camera work and things, and then he went back to Boulder. Mm -hmm. And um, now he's got two children and oh, he's know. married and got two children. And his wife's a professor at University of Colorado. Wow. And um, he's a landscape photographer. And if you haven't seen his work, you need to look at it. Cause it I haven't caught up with that. Spectacular uh, ph photographs. Yeah, yeah. Did you see him after he had the, uh, the frostbite? Uh, I guess it was up in I, Alaska. Yeah, I haven't seen him in person oh, okay. for a long time. We communicate by email and occasionally by phone call. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I think sometime in the last three or four months I, I chatted with him. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was so skinny that when, you know, he got up to Alaska, he had no... Yes. No, <laughs> yeah. his, his hands, his feet... Uh, you've read his right book up. of that ascent. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, you know, saw him, you know, the... They all bandaged, bandaged up afterwards. Wow. And, yeah. Um, My wife um, knew Bar Barry and Lila Bishop for very well, and they lived only a couple of miles from here. Oh, I didn't realize that. So I got to know them pretty well until they went off to Nepal to do, Barry was going to do his doctoral thesis in Nepal to oh, collect yeah. the data for that. Right. So they went off to live in Nepal, and we helped them pack their truck, and they, 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 they took their truck to ship their truck to Europe and then drove to Nepal. Oh, I remember that, yeah. And um, yeah. we bought their old Volvo station wagon wow. from them and took a whole bunch of stuff that they couldn't take with them and they rented their house out and, and took off. What did they do with the kids? They took them with them. Oh, I didn't realize the whole group. Huh? Tara and Brent were raised in, in Nepal, mountain and, villages right. in Nepal. Right. And um, they used to come with us also to our cabin in Virginia mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. for caving and swimming and running. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brent and I used, when he was just a just young a kid, kid right. we would run run some of the mountains out there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I guess he's in Seattle now. Yeah, I haven't seen him for ages. Uh, Trudy saw Lila a couple of years ago. Right. And, um, and met, you know, Tara's married to Greg Mortensen. Oh, that's right. That's right. I'd, I'd forgotten that. And so Trudy got right. to see Laura, uh, uh, Lila, and meet and meet Greg and Tara, who we haven't seen for many, many years. Mm -hmm. What was uh, what kind of climber was Barry? What kind of climber was Barry? Um, I never went rock climbing with him. I don't think he was a very good rock climber. Let's see. Well, he had. Of course, by then he had lost his toes, so he had, he, he right. couldn't do much. He had a hard time hiking even, right? Forever, and he, he had a lot of pain. Oh, I didn't know. I remember he experienced. Um, there was a woman caver, I think, a dentist in um, Pittsburgh. Can't remember her name, mm -hmm. but she used hypnosis hmm. in her dentistry, and Barry knew her somehow, and mm -hmm. and um, she taught him to use hypnosis to get over the pain in his toes. Right. We would, I remember we'd go hiking on the Billy Goat Trail and Barry had a hard time negotiating even those rocks. Right. So, you know. Right. I remember him wearing very heavy boots to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to yeah. try and support his, uh, his uh, toes. And... So we, we sort of stay in touch with Lila kind of a once a year thing. Mm -hmm. And um, unfortunately never made a, a, a trip over there, a hiking trip or anything. Always right. wanted to, but. Right. Never got a. Right. When I, once I started my own business, it was nose to the grindstone for many, many years. Right. Except for the right. midday climbing. <laughs> Did Barry talk much about his business? You know, making the tents and all, all that. Well, stuff? yeah, we were very involved in that. Oh. A, a Trudy. Trudy was. Um, Trudy did the illustrations for the directions on how to set up the tent. <laughs> and in payment, receive we had our received a Bishop Ultimate Bishop tent. Bishop Ultimate tent. Right. Wow. And um, now, when when do you think he started that? Um, I don't know when it's. Well, let's see. It was before the Everest trip, wasn't it? Um, no, it was in. Um, it was. It must have been. I would say sixty six. 
just yeah. as a guess. Okay. Because when I met Trudy, she had already, I think she had finished doing the work, the, the illustrations for the setup. Okay. And... Um, they used to make them at what was then Appalachian Outfitters? Is yeah, that right? yeah. Right. And then... Um, and I don't remember... You know, I, I wasn't involved. At the, that was the only connection I had right. with, the, with the tent business. But, right. But right. we used that tent for years. Yeah. On camping trips and, yep. and around the country. And yeah, they were they were kind of ahead of their time. Yeah, yeah, they really were. But they weren't real easy to set up. Oh uh, no, <clears throat> no, lots of poles. So yeah, yeah, interesting because most people don't even know that yeah. that existed here or where it was. And now, of course. The buildings at Appalachian Outfitters are gone. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, uh, B. Maurer, who used to work with them, she was one. She was did most of the sewing. Yeah, and uh, a, a woman named Kathy Anberg uh, worked for. Her. Okay. She she became a climber. Actually, she came to work for me also. And um, interesting. She had been sewing on the tents and mm -hmm. with Lila, and um, I met her at Carter Rock, and she became an employee when I had the machine shop here in the house. Right. I think that was a year before Glenn Randall came. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, then she went to graduate school. Mm -hmm. And um, You still in touch with her? Uh, I haven't been for several years, but sort of, yeah. Right. She became a pretty good climber. And then I guess during the 70s, you know, we did some climbing off and on. And... Um, Eventually, I think it just, nothing happened that I couldn't climb, but I just sort of faded out of it. Mm -hmm. Probably the last time I've been really climbing was in maybe the 76 or something like that. Well, it's hard to stay climbing when you don't get better. And true. And, you know, if you're not doing it all the time, as you get older, you need to do it more and more to stay good. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's, it's and hard. then I, I devoted so much time to caving and things that you know I, it was spread too thin. I think. Right. Do you think the caving uh, ecology consciousness has something to say to climbers? Well, I don't know what the climbing situation is now. Um, I know a little bit about how Chenard was involved with you know getting mm -hmm. rid of the pitons back in the old days. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, things like that. I don't know what anything about the climbing scene now. Um, but yeah, cavers, the, the cave environment is so fragile. Mm -hmm. it, you know, if you put a footprint there, it'll 10,000 years from now, it might still be there. So it call, it, and things just don't change there. So that really became um, a movement in the late 60s and early 70s in, in caving. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course that's just developed to be pretty rigorous now. Right, and that was also happening in the society at large. You know, it was yes, good, you know, yes, is that awareness environmental came to, war? Yeah, yeah. nineteen seventy, the EPA was started. That yeah, sort of yes, yeah. yeah, Earth Day, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, uh, so I, you know that's just developed. Who do you think your heroes were of, among the, the people that you knew? Uh, let's see. I think certainly Arnold Wexler was a hero. Um, not so much for the rock climbing, but because in, even though I never joined him on a mountaineering trip, I thought, you know, boy, these guys are going up into the bugaboos and mm -hmm. really Selkirks and interesting places and doing these ice and snow climbs and seeing this really remote country and everything and that that uh, I thought very highly of that on the wild side uh, Tony Solar and mm -hmm. Ray Moore became sort of heroes because they just did unusual things mm -hmm. and um, interesting tale there is uh, we were my dad and I went with Tony and Ray to a cave in Virginia Mm -hmm. And um, which the entrance is in the bottom of a sinkhole, and it's a drop of about 30 feet. 
not mm -hmm. a vertical drop. You can w c climb down there, mm -hmm. but almost one side of it's almost vertical. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I guess we were going to use some dynamite to to move a rock, break open a rock. So Ray and Tony had a case of dynamite. They pulled out of the back of their car, and they, and this was we didn't know anything about dynamite. This was our first exposure to dynamite. Mm -hmm. So they said, um, we're going to toss these down to you and be very careful because if you drop them, they, it might go off and it'll blow you up. And, and so we hook, line, and sinker. We took the bait. My dad and I climbed down there and they, they took the first stick of dynamite and said, you ready? You sure you're ready? And everything. And they very gently threw it down and we caught it and, and you know, gently put it down. And they said, now be careful down there, be careful. So then the next stick came down. And then shortly afterwards, it was raining dynamite on us. <laughs> and we were terrified. <laughs> and they were literally throwing four or five sticks at a time. And they were hitting our heads and banging on the ground and everything. And they were laughing hysterically. That was the sense of humor these guys had. Oh, God. <clears throat> they didn't tell you that nice, fresh dynamite is pretty safe. Uh, yeah. 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 And um, so anyhow, that... That got us into using explosives to, to crack rocks and move rocks in caves and things like that. Wow. As well as just have fun outside. <laughs> My dad strung prime accord at the cabin one day. We got I don't know, we got we knew somebody in the Marines or something and mm -hmm. snitched us some plastic explosives, including prime accord. Mm -hmm. My dad strung a clothesline, <laughs> replaced the clothesline at our family cabin with prime accord. My brother and I came back from the cave and put our wet coveralls on the prime accord. Mm -hmm. My dad came out and set it off. It cut the coveralls in half. <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> wow. So anyhow, wow. but uh, Tony was, especially Tony was interesting because he was such a good rock climber. And right. He also flew. He had a plane. He right. used to fly to Seneca right. occasionally. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting. Wow. Plus all the sailing, and they, they just didn't sail in the bay. They would go down to the Bahamas, and they were in, into scuba diving. They took me on my first diving trips and things too. Wow! And uh, I fooled around with a little cave diving back in early '60s. And um, when it was really dangerous, managed to live through the experience. Right. right. I only did about four caves, I guess. And uh, but they were all solo, and they were different. You know. Wow. Pretty scary stuff. I should think. And, uh, At any point, did you say, "Is this a good idea?" I did. I, you know, it was first of all, it was very cold, and I didn't have, a, I didn't, I made my own little wetsuit out of eighth-inch mm -hmm. um, foam material, yeah. neoprene foam, and you know, it was, it was essentially nothing. Right. It didn't fit tight enough. Forty-nine there. degree water. Where was this? In in um, in Virginia, in Highland mm -hmm. County. Oh, okay. And um, in. Germany Valley, I, I dove uh, Judy Spring. Judy Spring, right. I went in there, got into zero visibility, and lost contact with my rope to get me back out again. Thought I was a goner, managed to find it and get out. But I was so cold, I couldn't believe it. Wow. But I could, somehow I could go in that, stand that water. Was, in mat matter of fact, the, the Judy Spring dive, I didn't have any suit. Right. At all, and went in right. my swimming trunks. Wow, forty-nine degree water for probably thirty minutes. I don't know oh, how Lord. I managed. Lord, I came out. I was so hypothermic. I remember just shaking and shaking and shaking. Right, and um, right. that was the longest dive. It was probably only thirty minutes, but boy, that was a longest thirty minutes of your life. Oh man, that was wow. terrifying. I did uh, a dive in um, Aqua Cave in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Which is the resurgence of Butler Cave system. Okay. And a dive in Blue Spring in Virginia. Right. And where else? Uh, maybe those three. Uh, did Did you contribute to people uh, learning about cave diving, or is uh, no? I just okay. did it on my just own. Did it on your own. And I started with oh, no experience diving. Tony and Ray taught me how to use a scuba gear in a, in a quarry up at Halltown mm -hmm. in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. So I'd had about two days scuba diving, and then I decided <laughs> I could to use that to go in the cave. I made my own underwater light, made mm -hmm. my own under underwater reel with a cord, okay, alpine cord, uh, okay. eight-inch parachute cord, okay, and um, 
and just took off. Wow. Somehow lived through that. I was going to say, yeah, that's you're, you're a lucky man. And then I didn't do any more. <laughs> we, we, one of the Butler Cave guys was a world-class cave diver, Ron Simmons. And oh, okay. He spent, he truly had been cave diving all over the world and caving all over the world. And he just, he got killed in a Florida cave about three years ago. It was just a tragedy for us because he was very active in our group. Mm-hmm. Anything you you know that you can think of that you want to say that we forgot or? Uh... Well, let's see. I don't know. Um, can't think of anything else. I guess. Well, we certainly uh, we we got some some pretty important stuff. Don't want to babble on for too long. <laughs> you, you know, there's one thing, I, one or two things I'd like to tease out. Sure. One is, I think, the Washington climbing scene. For a long time now, it's been an interesting place in that it doesn't have the same amount of, of rocks as somewhere like the Tetons or being out in Denver or Boulder, but it still seems to be a pretty vibrant, interesting community. And I think part of that is for the reasons you spoke of is in relation to the types of people that DC attracts. Do you have any ideas or the types of people that climb here? Well, in my experience was, um, I think, twofold in, in the Washington climbing scene. That was when I was young, in the 50s, mm -hmm. um, and spent time with the real old-time climbers. And then when I started again in the 70s, after doing a lot of caving during the 60s, <clears throat> I started for a short period of time, for a, a, maybe just two years, I did a lot of local, mm -hmm. you, you know, difficult climbing. And... Um, with Bob Lyons and that, that group. And they, they were a totally different group of people. And yes. at that time, I, I think Matt Hale was a student, so he hadn't gone on mm -hmm. to his career. Um, and, but that was a distinctly sociologically different group of people. Yeah. And they had a different approach to, to climbing than, mm -hmm. the, than the old school. Um, and then I guess, um, and then in the, sometime in the middle to late 70s, I stopped completely climbing. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what the scene is today. And, you know, occasionally I go out to Carter Rock and just walk, walk by and watch people climbing. And, but I don't know what the situation is. Maybe that the stamp of the sort of serious professional person mm -hmm. doing climbing as a part-time activity has has stuck around all these years uh, I don't know I think it has yeah and uh, that, that's an interesting thing it is curious um, um, why so many people here yeah um, I guess you know um, uh, Herb Kahn used to say that it was because they had the time off uh -huh. um, but a lot of people here don't seem to take a lot of time off yeah yeah. Hmm. But it has continued, like well, you know, Matt Hale was at, you know at, at EPA for almost thirty years. You know, so mm -hmm. it's uh, it's still there. Um, did you ever do you ever know a fellow named Bob Hinshaw? I I had heard the <coughs> name, and I'm not sure if I ever met him. Mm -hmm. But it, it is a familiar name. I always wondered what happened. He was a little older than I. He was in college, mm -hmm. I think, when um, maybe I was still in high school. Mm -hmm. And um, he lived in Frederick, but I remember he was a very interesting guy. How so? Quite a good climber, and I think he was going to be a geologist. I just wondered. Right. If, I, you know. I have not, not heard anything of late, you know, but I've no, I know the name. Yeah. And I'm not sure if I, if I ever met him or not. Yeah. Uh, but I, I had the same experience with uh, folks at NIH that you did, you know, where people that are world-class scientists yeah. are, are often very gifted climbers. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know what it is, except, you know, they, it, it, seemed, you know, it seems to be still with us. Yeah, yeah, that, that is interesting. Cause, you know, there are a lot of young kids now that, that climbing seems to be a, a, a really youth sport. I mean, we have relatives. My 
my wife's niece's son, mm -hmm. you know, is an avid rock climber, except he, I don't think he hard, he's never been on a rock, hardly. Right. We've taken him to Carter Rock a couple of times, but they climb right. artificial walls all the time. Right. And have competitions. Right. And, you know, it's just kind of a different world. And uh, I don't know how that climbing stacks up against the real rock climbing. It's probably the same kind of thing. Difficult, can be very difficult. Can be, yes. yes. One uh, other thing I'm interested in teasing out a little bit is uh, the way that one learned to climb um, back when you were first getting into climbing. It seemed to be more of a mentorship and tutelage. And a lot of people now are learning through classes. And can you speak to a little bit about your early relationships as you were getting involved in the sport? Yes, when we started climbing, of course, there were no there were no schools, there were no classes, there were no artificial walls, and um, there was this you know group of people that we've been talking about, and uh, you know in our case it was our family that came out, mm -hmm. and uh, all four of us, and um, we were just invited to to climb, and you know we just picked it up and learned how to belay by watching and. Um, it, 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 I guess as, as they thought we were safe to, to let us right. hold their rope, then they would right. let us do that. And the, the only organized belaying thing I recall was, um, you know, discussions with them, with people on how to belay and mm -hmm. what to do and what not to do. And then, of course, using the Oscar belay Oscar. dummy. Right. And the, the thrill of being up in the platform, up in the tree, and having that thing go whizzing by you really left an impression in my mind. Oh, can you describe that? Because most people, you know, talk about it as catching it on the ground. Yeah. No, they had a platform, I don't know, 30 feet up in the tree, 40 feet up in the tree. Wow. A little teeny platform. Mm hmm And you tie yourself into the platform. Mm hmm and, um, and Oscar would go up, I don't know. 10 feet above you mm -hmm. or more and they'd cut the thing loose and it would come by the platform like a falling boulder that it was and mm -hmm. uh, and then you would I can't remember whether we had the rope around the tree in back of you mm -hmm. I think our back was up against the tree and we were tied into it mm -hmm. and but you got a real feeling of exposure because mm -hmm. you're up on this little platform in a tree and here you've got to hold this give a dynamic arrest to this big weight mm -hmm. that's tearing by at 50 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a thrill. Now, um, when you say dynamic arrest, most people don't even understand what that means anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. You want to describe Well, the of course, back then, if you had to, to stop a leader fall or even a second person that might have slack in the rope, mm -hmm. um, you learn to, um, to, well, you, you, you didn't have much choice, really, but by by design and practice, you could give a good estimate as to um, how much room the person had to fall, and and how far they, how much they had left to go, and and how far they had mm -hmm. fallen. So you would dissipate that energy required to stop the person from falling. You would dissipate the energy over time mm -hmm. by um, letting the rope slide on purpose, and then mm -hmm. and then gradually increasing the friction around your body mm -hmm. with ever more angular contact on your body until you were able to bring them to a stop. Okay. As opposed to, of course, trying to stop them all at once. Right. Which, which um, might end up in a disaster for everyone. Right. Breaking the rope. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. tearing you off of your stance. perch and yeah. stance and everything. Uh, now, you were like wearing leather gloves? Yeah. And the, we, we, of course, on the ground, we had this big leather patch. Right. But up in the tree, I think maybe we had the rope behind the tree, I, and I'm not quite sure. If we didn't have the rope behind the tree, we had this great big cowhide patch, okay, two feet square or something that went around your back. Okay. Of course, that that didn't give much friction, so you really had to ah, you really had to apply right what you've learned about right. changing the angle, starting out letting it slide, and then gradually bringing your hand across the front of your body right so that you would increase the amount of friction and bring the person to a slow stop right a deceleration right. until they stopped right and um, done correctly it was a very effective way of stopping people right in Europe at the time I remember they were still using shoulder, shoulder belays belay. yeah and which I tried once and it, I don't see how you could stop anything with a shoulder belay yeah 
It's an absolute disaster. Right. Yeah. It, the, it, the, you have no physics working for you. You're right. And, right. Um, right. So, so you were doing a waist or hip belay? Yes, waist okay. belay. And when you were up on the platform, you would have like your tie-in below you the were, active you, I think you were tied in straight to the tree. Right. And, and then, then the belay rope would be up on top of that. And the belay so rope would be on top of pull that. pull out from under you. But it was essentially a waist belay. Right. And, and on the and ground, it, you'd do it under your butt so that you... Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, did you select clothing <laughs> that would uh, give you some protection? No, I think the leather patches did it. Okay. They did all the work. Okay. How about when you were climbing? Um, well, usually, um, you know, you were through carabiners... Okay. So if you were, if you were tied in as a second, mm -hmm. and um, the leader took a fall, um, you know, it'd be below your butt because the rope would be going up. Right. But w we didn't have any patches or pads or anything. We just okay. depended on. Okay. Of course, Chris Gordos taught the good half repel, mm -hmm. so I, I I got a pretty tough hide from doing that kind of thing. Right. I remember you know rappelling down. All the all the big f drops at uh, Carter Rock and mm -hmm. everything with the ha half repels mm -hmm. and zipping down like he did. I got burned a couple of times pretty badly. Better describe that process. I saw it, so uh, most people don't even know what that means. Well, the Scordos half repel is instead of wrapping the leg, the the rope, you know, under your leg and across your chest and down your back, mm -hmm. giving you a lot of body contact mm -hmm. and um, dissipating any heat mm -hmm. that way. Um, Scordos would just take the rope, um, you'd hold the, the rope with your left hand and the rope would go under between your legs and out the right hand side mm -hmm. and that's all. Right. And you would essentially about 50% of the force needed to stop you as you came down the face was in the gloved hands. Right. And the other little bit was on your butt. And you rappel down Jan's face in just like, I don't know, two or three seconds. Right usually hitting with a pretty good thud at the bottom. Right. And, um, right. A friend of mine asked him if that didn't hurt, and he said, well, at my age, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I took a big shine to that. I thought that was really fun. Wow. And did half repels all the time. Right. When did climbing harnesses appear? Never, never used never one. Never used one. Even in the 70s, I didn't right. use any. Okay. We tied directly into the rope. We still tied into the rope. Now, we did have a harness for caving, for pit caving. Sure. We, um, matter of fact, speaking of dynamic... Sorry. I, can, oh. I can hear the... I think the TV's been turned on upstairs. Oh. Uh, what, what, I mean, oh, hold it. Oh, 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 right. Yeah, right. Hey, Trudy! Trudy! Okay, we're, we're back. Okay. okay. Uh, anyhow, we took... We did dynamic belaying in, in caving in a very interesting way. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that my dad, who, with two teenage sons, would do these sort of things, but I guess he was pretty crazy too. When we got to Hellhole Cave in Germany Valley, in West Virginia, mm -hmm. that's, uh, I don't remember, about 150, 160 feet, right. free, free drop. Free repel, right. And there's a central hole. You can come in from the side or you can come in from the top. Mm -hmm. So we rigged up uh, with a manila rope. We rigged and we got a parachute harness and cut, cut the back out of it. Mm -hmm and um, clipped into that. And then we, we, we measured the hole, we measured our rope, and we made a coil, coil of rope um, between the, the, the uh, person that was gonna go down the pit, jump mm -hmm. down the pit, mm -hmm. made a coil of rope, and we left about, I don't know, let's say 30 or 40 feet of, in a coil. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I mean, the coil, was 30 or 40 feet shorter than the hole. And then, wow. so the coil would sit in front of the belayer. Mm -hmm. The rope went back behind a tree. We didn't use a, a pad. Mm -hmm. And we had big, heavy gloves on. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the rope was coiled on the, behind the belayer. Mm -hmm. So the person to do the, the free drop mm -hmm. would just jump in the hole and go do a free fall oh, wow. for maybe, uh, it's probably more than 30 or 40 feet. I, I would say halfway down the 150-foot hole, you'd be in free fall. Oh, my God. And then the coil would disappear. Right. And the rope would come to the belayer, and he right. would dynamically belay the rest of the way down the hole. 
And my dad, my, I did that. My brother did it. My father did it. <laughs> and we thought that was great fun. Um, and we would we would always be arrested, you know, twenty or mm -hmm. twenty feet before we hit the bottom. But it was a real thrill. I'll bet to go in the hole like that. Wow. And uh, I don't know whether maybe Huntley Ingalls did that with us too. Okay. I don't know where we got these nutty ideas. Well, I think your father had something. To do with that. <laughs> <laughs> you had help. I think so. Yeah. But uh, that was a a, a good. Uh, a good use of the dynamic belay. Wow, wow! Anything else you could think of? Andrew? I think uh, I think that's good. Yeah, yeah. This has been great. Good. Oh, this is great. I mean, it's uh, you know the, the aluminum piton story alone. <laughs> it, you know that's that's history um, that no I don't nobody knew. Oh really? I think it's been completely forgotten. Yeah. See, we never wrote up any climbs or anything. Right. And. Um, right. So back, you know, it's well, no, to, to to be able to talk to you about the first ascent of you know of that is just that's that's marvelous. Yeah, yeah. No, that's marvelous stuff. I'd love to go back to Champ and see that. Yeah, yeah. It, you can still get in, you know, if you want to get back in there. Uh -huh. I, I've got friends that can get you in there. Wow. Uh, but it's uh, uh, it it didn't get to be a big deal getting in there until uh, the flood of '85. Is that the is that when the flood destroyed a town down there, um, Riverton or somewhere? Uh, yeah, it, it pretty well took out Riverton, and took out both of the bridges down there, uh, and the um, um, uh, the government came in and started you know pull, reconstructing the 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 river so that it wouldn't you know do that as much anymore, mm -hmm. and, and Bureau of Reclamation. And they were basically, you know, handing out money for damages. And the guy who owns the land uh, adjacent to the river at Champ didn't feel he, had, he got a, a fair deal. Oh. And that's when, when he just stopped letting folks in there. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it, that's the only, it's all public land on the other side of the river. Right. But, um, you know, getting through his pasture. And for a long time, he kept this big, angry bull. Right. Um, much like the dogs. Uh, right. That, that used to be there. Wow. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I know it well because I've been back there a few times and actually had to rescue somebody out of there. Wow. Yeah. Gee yeah. whiz. Yeah. So, but I guess people don't go there very often. Then. Not very often. Not very often because he's not all that keen on having folks in there. Right. Um, and in the summer, you know, some people could, would take a boat in, yeah, you know, put in at Seneca and then go down there. Right. But um, then where are you going to get out? Um, then you'd have to basically go all the way down a smoke hole. Right. And in the summer, most people, you know, won't put a boat in there because it's not enough water. Ray Moore and Tony Solar went from from Seneca um, all the way to Washington D.C. once. Really. In a boat. In boats. When was that? Kayaks and rubber boats. I'm going to say in the or in six, maybe 61. Wow. Because I remember I had a, a Jeep station wagon, that old square Jeep station wagon with four-wheel drive. Yep, the Jeepster. And I took that down into the river mm -hmm. when they were starting their trip. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had the... the the bolts that were holding the front axle in place got sheared off on the rocks down there, and the oh axle God. shifted back. Oh my God! <laughs> we had to drive back to Franklin or something with the axle at about a ten degree angle to the oh my to lord the back. Oh my lord! And then they did the whole trip down there. Wow! It was interesting. How long did it take them? I I don't remember. It must have been like weeks. Weeks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when I was flying, I I did a little bit. You know, I wanted to, to try to fly the entire river, all of the branches and everything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I did a little bit of it, but I never got around to it. I still think it would make an interesting documentary movie Yeah. to fly the entire Potomac River drainage basin. Um, right. And shooting it. Wow. Yeah. That's, um, I know people who've done some, some still work doing that. But uh, nothing like uh, uh, doing the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Huh. But they, 
this one thing that made Tony and Ray so interesting. They were they were doing all these you know, I guess really and, different projects. Yeah, and that's that's nobody remembers that now. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. This has been great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh,